I say it humbly, but it's a very unusual book. And although it's my story, I sort of found it unusual when I read it. Who's it written for? You know, um, villains, addicts, um, broken people, you know, all ranges of people that are broken. People who are frightened to reveal their inner truths. There's so much else in there about crime, about relationships, uh, it's betrayal, dysfunction, poverty, wealth, um, prisons, uh, big crimes. There's enjoyment for a, a number of different people in there, I believe. And I just pray that we, that people have hope that they can change the future if there's been a number of sort of dysfunctional situations in their own uh, forefathers. I've got few in mind. Hi you guys, welcome to Michael's Meets. Today we have a, a, a wonderful guy who joined us, a good friend of mine, good brother, uh, Shane. Got a wonderful story, and I'm really pleased he came today. And we've got lovely Hattie here, who, who wrote the book. So um, anyway, welcome to all of you, and I'll hand over to you, Hattie. Great, thanks, Michael. So hi, I'm Harriet Compton. I co-wrote Sins of Fathers, and it's very exciting to be here live. Um, so first of all, um, it's been, the book was released um, a month ago and it's been an incredible month. So I just want to turn back to Michael to share a bit of an update on what's oh, been happening. Oh, thank you. <laughs> an update on the book. I mean, yeah, look, we've been very blessed, very busy, um, get some wonderful feedback. Um, it seems to be doing one or two things. Uh, people who I haven't heard from for years have found me, um, on this sort of social media stuff that we do. Um, one friend I haven't seen for 40 years, he made an amends to me. Um, you know, it, it seems to be growing well. We're doing lots of stuff. We're sort of trying to look at the mental health stuff, the, the addict, the prisoners, uh, and the book's doing really well. I mean, it's out there, people are enjoying it. Um, and it's got that wow factor. And I say it humbly, uh, you know, cause I don't think it's just about me, this is about, what the book's meant to do and uh, uh, right at the moment i'm a i'm a happy customer so thank you great thanks michael so we are thrilled to have shane taylor here today and as michael mentioned shane has quite an extraordinary story shane was once one of britain's most dangerous prisoners um, who was involved in crime from a young age um, and eventually ended up being on the run for kidnapping and attempted murder he was eventually caught, um, but Jail did nothing to quell his rebellion, and he ended up stabbing two prison officers, sparking a riot. He was then um, sent to maximum security prison, um, where he was in the seg a lot. Um, but something amazing happened, which we will be hearing about later today. Um, so it'd be great to start with how you guys know each other. Um, so perhaps, Michael, you begin how you got to know Shane. When he stayed with me for the weekend with his with his children and uh, and they was like him they was quite lively but lovely children and his beautiful wife so I was sort of impressed with with this guy and and I and I took to him straight away real genuine bloke this fella. Thanks, Michael. And so Shane, um, do you remember the first time you met Michael? It sounds yeah, like um, a fun time at the farm. Yeah, I do remember that day, but I remember that uh, in the farm that um, the doors were. The frames were low and I kept smacking my head I had <laughs> on the top of my head when I went home. I remember, I remember. <laughs> so, um, Sins of Fathers goes right back to the beginning. The first chapter starts with Michael's grandfather and we talk about um, how really Michael inherited crime, um, how many down traits we say. Um, I mean, Shane, would you say the same was for you? Did you inherit crime or that violence? Um, I don't know, I just wanted to fit in. So mine didn't, so my dad wasn't, well, he was in and out of prison, but he wasn't in my life, so he didn't have an influence. So it was more trying to fit in because I was being picked on and bullied. Mm. So I was getting picked on and bullied a lot when I was young. I had carrot ginger hair, freckles, I was skinny, and people would just pick on me, everyone. And so I just felt like the, you know, the, the odd ball, the odd one out, never fitted in with anybody. I always got picked on. 
and that does something to you as a young kid. I wouldn't have known it at the time, but mm -hmm. as a young kid, I just remember always having this sense that I didn't belong to anything and I wasn't loved by anybody, even my young, even though my parent, and my mom, sort of brought me up in a nice way, by in a, 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 a an all right way in the sense of a lot of criminals get brought in a totally different way. I got what I wanted. I was spoiled, I think over spoiled. And then just when I was getting picked on and bullied all the time, I just remember having an uncle and he was always not with me, but he was always, I was always hearing stories of him fighting and stuff like that. So I don't know if you could chuck that in as, you know, generational thing. Mm -hmm. I just remember him always fighting and everyone mentioning them. And I just, to me, it was like, oh, wow, wow, wow. I want to be like him. And mm -hmm. it was more probably because of what I was going through. And that led me to sort of going down a route of hanging about with the local burglars and car thieves and robbers. And it was just to fit in. But even they picked on me and bullied me, but not as much as everybody else did. So that made me... Um, basically go down that route. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I remember when I was doing that, I was just, I was as soft as, you know, if you slapped me across the face, I'd run away crying. But I was just an absolute total thief. And it was more out of uh, boredom, not an organised thing. It was just loads of gangs of lads all getting together and going around burgling houses, pinching cars. And I think the police call it uh, an opportunist thieves. So we weren't Pacific criminals and did armed robberies or whatever. We would just roam the streets and whatever whatever we came across, we would we would do. So if we saw a car uh, with the keys in, we'd jump in and rob it. If we saw a house and the door was open, we'd creep in. Uh, if we went round the back of the shops, if we saw a mountain bike out the front of your house, we'd just get it sometimes just for the sake of it because it was fun to do. And that was my life. And I'm talking here, the age, anywhere from the age of probably... Honestly, when I'm talking about this, you're talking eight or nine year old. So as a young kid, that's all I did. And everyone around me did the same thing. Uh, and so I grew up into that for that reason. Um, so, but it started off just getting picked on and trying to fit in, trying to be one of the lads, basically. Um, yeah, and that was my young life from say, probably eight, nine, maybe younger up until I was about uh, 15 or something like that, and then everything started to change from then. Mm. Can you tell us a bit more about now how things began to change? How things began to change is I started to get fed up of people mugging me off, getting beat up all the time, people just taking liberties and meaning like just taking the mick out of me and just doing stuff. And one day, I remember I had a little fight back and I'll never forget it. I just remember, I, no, I, I told you I always felt like I didn't fit in and I was the odd one out and stuff like that. And when I had this fight and I fought back, the lad wasn't hard enough, but he was a bit handier than us. And I remember people coming up to us and giving us attention and, oh, it's walking to us, oh, and I had a fight. And I just remember getting this sense of, yeah, people are noticing me, I'm getting this attention and this is what I want. And then I didn't also, as this was happening, I slowly started to knock back down. Still nobody really, nobody knew me, but just started not to back down from people. But what I didn't count on was um, mental health. Because what happened is I started to um, watch a film called uh, Goodfellas. And there's a part in the film where they try to they've killed someone or think he's dead. And the... the they hear a noise as they're driving along and they open the boot and he's there, but he's still alive. So one of them pulls out a knife and starts stabbing him and it makes like a <laughs> sound. And I just remember my hair standing on end and just this rush, energy feeling like rush. And I thought, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And I would play the film over that part over and over and over and over again. And started to um, do stuff. Even when my mates were in, I'd do their heads in because I'd be like, watch this, watch this. And I'd have them sat there for hours just watching the same part of the clip of this man getting stabbed. And so these, this film had a little bit of an influence on when I was turning mentally ill. And, and I just remember saying, sack it. 
no one's going to cross for me anymore. I don't care who they are. I don't care how big they are. I, I'm going to go out there. And I, I've never said this before, but I remember this thought pattern. I remember thinking, I'm not the hardest man in the world. So how do you get the hardest man in the world to fear you? And then I realised to do that, you have to be willing to go to prison for the rest of your life and not be bothered about it. And that sent me off down a path of absolute madness. Um, uh, I remember going into uh, Hartlepool in the northeast of England. And there was a local hard lad there who was well known for stabbing people. And he just getting out of prison. No one would cross with him, really, because he was a bit of a psych nutter. And we came to blows. He basically, we came to blows. He pulled out, a, to, to cut the short, the story short, he ended up we're in the middle of the town centre. We were in the middle of the road. All the buses were stopped and everyone was watching. And he pulled out a hammer. I pulled out, uh, as he come running towards me, he smashed me across the top of my head with a hammer. But as he was doing that, I pulled out a nine-inch kitchen blade and I stabbed him straight top of his head and I come out of the, uh, his head there. Uh, and then I would uh, have someone shout, please, everyone scattered. And I was now on the run for attempted murder. At this point, you give up on life. And I thought, sack it. And I went on a rampage. I was kicking people's doors in. Um, I remember kicking uh, a family. I went to the door base, kicked the door in. They barricaded themselves in the, um, uh, in the back room. Mm. Um, so... Yeah, they barricaded themselves in the back room, which just upsets me a bit that because with me being a father now, with kids, mm. you know, it's, it's the last thing of, you want your kids to see anything like that, any kind of thing like that. So that just sort of hits me now at this point. It didn't at the time, really didn't care at the time, but it, it's a bit of a problem now. Um, yeah. Um, so, just, so just also to, to go to Michael, because... I mean, hearing Shane talk, obviously, you've def you can identify in many ways. I mean, what particularly struck me was the kind of whoosh, which um, Shane described as feeling that adrenaline, which yeah. you know, you've talked in the past about. Yeah, yeah, I just listened to him. And it is my, we're not trying to glorify crime here um, at all. Um, what we're trying to establish is, is um, you know, the change and, and, and the pain and the mental health. And, and my heart goes out to the guy because I know that, we we can't live in regret, but I do know that that, that, that that he's very remorseful and he's he's very sad and but he can tell you that himself. I, I was just just a bit taken back again to listen to it again, and I've heard it before, but I just felt the the pain in there. So yeah, for me, the whoosh was uh, <laughs> the whoosh was the whoosh, and, and I suppose I thrived on on, uh, on the buzz on the adrenaline. Um, my, my crimes were, were motivated by madness, uh, uh, finances, uh, popularity. You know, I, I, it was always about uh, the ego because I had so much low self-worth that I wanted to be noticed. And, and, you know, and this operates in a way that is not a reality. Uh, and, and, he, and, and, and Shane just hit it right on the nut. It, it's mental health issues, and it definitely, definitely is. Uh, you know, and, and, and for mine, you're my grandfather, my father, but but just to listen to it, and and we're not glorifying crime at all, um, and it's just thank God that that we come through unscathed, uh, and and I'm not saying that both been punished, both you know all sorts of things have gone on, but that adrenaline buzz, you know, was one of the things that used to ignite it, and even when you got something, when you were successful. It was still never enough. It was still never enough. There weren't enough sex. I don't mean to be rude. There weren't enough money. There weren't enough coke. There weren't enough cannabis. There weren't enough nothing. But the light of love comes through. And, and, and I know that people don't really want to hear about crime. But I think we, we're, we're talking about it to understand that there's a chance for everybody. Do, do we just do, do we make it right? No, but today it's about change, and that adrenaline whoosh goes into good things today. You know, there's still an adrenaline buzz, but it's not about to be dysfunctional anymore. Mm -hmm. Hey, now going back to you, I mean, talking just you know about the dark and the light. Um, I mean, your time in prison. Could you just tell us a bit about it? I know you're in the the same wing as Charles Bronson, and you had a pretty hardcore time. If you could just tell us briefly about it. 
it was more no it was more um anti anti authority and just totally totally just hating the system and um I went into prison with a bit of a reputation anyway for being a bit nuts when I went in on my last sentence because I'd been in and out as a young burglar and stuff before I started getting the reputation for being a psycho. But uh, that the, the, the big reputation was on the last eight year sentence. And it was basically just, um, I, I just hated authority basically. Didn't have, I had test, I had a bad, bad experience from them as well. And they wound me up a lot as well. They, at the time, I was a massive lad at the time who used to love me training. And because I was a bit paranoid, I used to always train and keep myself right, wouldn't take drugs much, just healthy and strong at all times so I could be ready if I had to fight basically. I went and told Pete I was going to get this officer because he wouldn't let me go to the gym. Uh, and so we basically planned and plotted and set up to, to get, get this officer who wouldn't let me go to the gym. And uh, I came out myself with a, a coffee, a huge, massive glass coffee jar about that big, wrapped it in a towel as if I was going in the showers. I got the glass jar out, smashed the bottom off, so the bottom came off, so I still had the jar. And I ran up to the officer and started trying to cut his neck and face and everything, but he was putting his hands up. So I was catching him in his hands, so then I started trying to get him in his groin and everything, and he was putting his legs up, and then I trapped him into the corner, stabbed him a few times. Another in officer come, he got alleged, I say. And the reason why I say that is not that I'm saying I ever did it, but by now I'm in a frenzy that I don't know what's happening. I couldn't tell you from then, I just know that. I remember finishing what I needed to do, laid down on the floor, and that was it. Uh, instantly became a, a very dangerous prisoner from that moment on, and ended up going to all the top security prisons. When I got there, they wouldn't allow me on the wings. So I was too dangerous to go on the wings. And then just got fed up being segregated off constantly because they didn't want to put me on the wings. And went to war in my own head. Uh, rage war against them. Uh, I could I tried to attack them every time I could until I was eventually put on what they call um, CSC. It's a close supervision circuit. And it's for... It, it's basically... You're in a maximum security prison. You're segregated uh, in a maximum security prison. You're segregated from the inmates because they say you're too dangerous. And then CSC is segregation from the segregation. And I just went from segregation to segregation to segregation. And how it is in them cells is the CSC cells are, um, they've got like a, a metal box where they've got like a hatch on the door. And if they're going to feed you, there has to be, um, they have to put like a metal box what locks onto the door and they'll unlock one side, put your food in, lock it, and then unlock the other side for you to get it. No physical contact at all. And if you sell door opens, there has to be six to seven prison officers in riot gear. And still, even when they came with the riot gear on, I would fight, I would battle them. Um, they would try and break, yeah. And, 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 uh, oh, I was the kind of in there where when they tried to break you, instead of it calming you down, it just mm. makes you 10 times worse. And I hated the system with a vengeance. And every chance I got, I would try and in some way get them back. Um, Absolutely. So I think so. I think now we're just going to um, go also to Michael's um, time prison. And we've got a, um, a film to share about that. And then really want to hear, because I know you had an amazing change. Um, so after that, we're going to hear all about that. But first of all, let's go to a video. And um, this is when Michael is in Exeter prison. And he is on trial for a £13 million drug smuggling operation. And he's really struggling with his drug addiction and has now started going to chapel. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Emmy came up and started singing a worship song. The song involved actions. Emmy was, shape Emmy was shapely, so when she bent down, most of the guys went, look at them. I said, oi, pack it up. Emmy was singing, it was, easy. it was an easy song to follow. Emmy did it again and we was all going deep, deep. Have I explained that song though? Is that an explanation or will people won't understand that, will they? Sorry, John T. Let me just go back. Oh no, I'll carry on if you don't mind. 
everyone was singing it and it was easy uh, everyone was singing it and it was an easy song to follow Emmy did it again and we was all going deep deep we were we were like kids now starting to enjoy ourselves and having a bit of a giggle about who could bend the lowest then the song stopped and Emmy asked to buy us to pray there were not a lot of Christians in the room. I included myself as a Christian because I had said the sinner's because I'd said the sinner's prayer and declared it out loud and declared it out loud. Tobias said a very simple prayer, come Holy Spirit. Suddenly people began to laugh, cry, and there was a real sense of a spiritual healing. Everyone everyone had an experience with the Holy Spirit. All 20 inmates just in 20 different ways. Emmy was looking up at us all saying, oh, Emmy, look at them, Bill cried out. Our father's got his children. I was thinking, oh my God. Then the spirit of God touched me. It was like something blew on me, like a cloud of love went up. A tear came to my eye and I heard the word hope. I sat down on a chair and I thought it never has to be like this anymore. Yep. Brilliant. Um, okay, so Shane, um, hearing just now about Michael's, the start of Michael's transformation, can you tell us what happened to yourself? Basically, my, my change began in a park uh, on the Isle of Wight in Parkhurst, and I was ship, shipped there for a bit. This Christian coming up to me, but while he was he came up to me and started trying to preach Jesus and everything like that, I just thought it was a loop. I just thought, what a nut that. But while he was coming and doing this, I remember I was involved in um, selling the heroin and I tried to put a hit on a prison officer and it all come on top, basically, and I ended up getting took to the segregation unit, went on a dirty protest, basically told me I've got to go back to a uh, top security prison. I went back to a top security prison, which was, uh, I think it was um, Full Sutton, uh, HMP Full Sutton in Worcestershire, went there, ruthless prison, uh, and within two weeks of being there, they opened my cell door, and he said, go to education. So I got up, went to education, I got to the other end, and the officer said, oh, your name's not on the list. So I made a fuss, and it was like sort of debate and arguing with them. And I must have done one of the heads in, because one of the officers, because I was going on, one of the officers stepped back and he went, go to the chaplaincy. And I just remember buzzing because obviously I don't have to go back to my cell now. So I just went through and went into the chaplain seat. And I remember a TV playing and it had this like posh grey haired guy, you know, like, hello. I, I know to be Nicky Gumbel now. I went and sat down, there was a circle of lads, I sat down and I just remember thinking, oh man, it's one of them mad Christian things. And I know some people think, oh, well, it's in the, cha in the chaplain, obvious. But not every, it's not all Christian stuff in the chapel. There's all sorts of stuff goes on. And uh, I just remember sitting down and I thought, I'll wait for this video to finish. Uh, when it finished, I went to basically go and the little woman said, uh, are you meant to be here? I said, oh, I don't know. She said, oh, well, your name's not on the list. I said, oh, well, I'll go there. And as I said that, um, one of the inmates sort of leaned into me and went, you get strawberry gattles and chocolate biscuits. I went, Miss, can you put my name down, please? You see, I wasn't going for any... Um, first of all, I shouldn't even have been there. Um, they, sh they opened my cell door to tell me that I was to, to go to education, but my name wasn't on the list, so why did they do that? Then the prison officer let me through when he shouldn't have, and someone pointed this out to me. Then he, he directed it to the chaplaincy. Why? And how about the perfect timing that an alpha course the basics of Christianity is on at the exact time when I walk in. And like, you know, we talk about coincidences, but there's a lot of coincidences there. That's what we want to believe. And uh, basically I kept going, but it was for the chocolate biscuits. And I started to hear something that I'd never heard before. See, when you, you, you're not brought up around Christian, the Christian faith, you see Christianity as a religion. You know, you've got to be this, perfect angel with sandals and cords on and a big beard and look like Jesus before before you can walk in a church kind of thing. And that's how I basically saw it. It was just good people and bad people. 
And I started to hear for the first time, like, you can be forgiven no matter what you've done in your life and stuff like that. And I was like, well, how? I thought you had to be good. I, I, just, I just couldn't grasp it. But anyway, time goes on. And I wanted to argue with them all the time, debate. And I, I'll never forget the day, Eddie Bake was called the chaplain, see. And he come up to me and he basically said, uh, uh, there was a Holy Spirit day, they prayed, nothing happened to me, for oh, RC, a load of rubbish. And then he came to me afterwards, Eddie, and said, um, uh, God's just told me for you to come here this afternoon on your own. And I thought, get me out of my cell. There'll be Bob and Biscuits and Nescaf. So definitely I'm coming down. So that was my reason of going back down. Went back down, went into the chaplaincy. Uh, I, looked for, I remember I had to look for him, but went into the chaplaincy. He got two chairs. And I, I remember him saying two scriptures. And one was, no one's righteous, not one. We all fall short of the glory of God. And the other one was um, about Jesus. I can't remember exactly which one. But I know it was about Jesus dying on the cross for our sins because he gave us a, a short gospel message from that, that was sinners and Jesus came to die for our sins. And then I just remember him saying, pray. And I remember, I remember thinking, well, well, what do you pray? What, what do you do? What do you say? And he said to me, from your heart, just say what you feel like you want to say, basically. And I just remember saying, um, God, if you're real, Please, I hate who I am, I hate who I've become. If you're real, come into my life, do something, show me something. Um, nothing happened at that point. And then I remember we'd stop praying, sat back, and then, um, yeah, I remember praying, and we sat back and we were just in a normal conversation. And when we're in the normal conversation, I just remember um, suddenly starting to feel this energy feeling in my stomach, like a, 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 I can't explain, you know, I've never put my hand in a socket and got electrocuted, but it just, the, my only human term of explaining, it felt like an energy feeling in my stomach. And it started to raise up and raise up and raise up. And as it started to raise up, I am um, uncontrollably... Um, Sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. Do you know what? This I say this all the time too. This was 11 years ago. But it still gets me that. Because my life just totally changed at that point. Now, I'm not saying it hasn't been hard and I haven't failed and I haven't made mistakes and it hasn't been a battle. But in a whole... That was the change of my whole life. Um, I ran on the wing with the Bible. <laughs> this is funny, <laughs> I ran on the wing with the Bible. And if you're known for attacking officers in top security prisons, the standing groups and movements, and if they know you're for attacking officers, they're very aware of who you are, get shown pictures you every day, watch out for him. If he threatens you, he means it, follow through, get him off the wing kind of thing. And I ran up to the officers with a Bible in my hand and I jumped in front of them and they all jumped back into a fighting stance as if something was going to happen. And I went, it's real. And they were like looking at each other. After a couple of times of saying, it's real, one of them went to me, what's real? And I went, Jesus Christ, he's real. And they all split up and walked off. Um, and you know, I just remember running around the jail. I was, I was a new Christian, so I was a bit wild. And I, I was a bit like over the top, I'd guess. But I remember how, how bad I was. I remember walking down, there was an inmate, a Muslim lad, and I just saw it and I walked up to him and I said, um, what's, the, what's up? How come no one's with you? He went, oh, I wouldn't stand with me. With me. I said, what for? He said, they, they all think I'm an informant. And I just started preaching things from going on like an absolute loon. And, and we started becoming like friends and... I remember about two days after, I've never done this, I was praying. I said, I'm going to pray for you that this is dealt with. I've never said this before, so I'm getting a bit excited, actually. And um, I remember a couple of days after he come to myself, he said, I thought you said you'd been praying. I said, look, just chill. I'm praying. Jesus is going to sort it out. Right? And about four days after that, he come back and he said, what were you praying? 
And I said, I just pray to God that everyone will totally forget what, all this issue you've got, and it's all going to go normal, and, and it's going to be sorted out. And he went, wow. I went, why? He went, it's like everyone's just forgot. He said, all my friends have just started coming back around me as if it never happened. He said, they're all my mates again. And I went, see, that's Jesus. And what? <laughs> no, he walked off. Yeah. And, and little things like that were happening. But I had a, a, a couple of failures in the prison. What really bothered me, I'd never mentioned this either. So I went back to the chaplaincy, to Eddie Baker, the chaplain. And I said, I'm not a Christian. How can you be a Christ How can I be a Christian? He said, well... What are you saying that for? And I explained the situation. I said, someone pull the knife and I flipped and I tried to grab, grab him. And I, uh, and I said, and then he said, uh, I explained all that. And he said, can I ask you a question? And I said, what? He said, if that had happened two years ago, what would have happened? I said, I'd have killed him. He said, and what did you do this time? I said, I fell to my knees and cried out to God. And then he looked straight at me and he said, uh, there's no change. And that was like a little lesson for me, that you don't become perfect overnight. That is, a, is you know, there's, there's a battle going on and things are happening. You know, Michael, you obviously had a similar transformation. You've had ups and downs, but also you've seen such tremendous healing as well through it. Could you just talk a bit about that healing? Yeah, you know, earlier when I spoke, I, I said about praying about getting things home. Well, what I was talking about was my smuggling, yeah? Uh, and so... As a young child, I, I had a, 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 a Catholic grandmother and she prayed and prayed and prayed. And I always had respect for the church, you know, respect for Jesus. But I couldn't stand the word born again Christian. I couldn't bear it. But as, as I've sort of gone on and, and I had my encounter, I'm not religious. Far from religion for me. So it's about the hole that was inside of me from abuse um, my behaviour, my, my, my forefathers, and it was something that existed. Mm. You know, I said I went to sleep, and then when I woke up, it woke up with me, and it was a gaping wound. Mm. And, and I used to, to sort myself out with drugs, women, crime, mm. adrenaline, fear, control, violence, anger, cowardice, everything that you don't want to be, I was, and it, and it operated from the function of, of, of my dysfunction, whether it be my forefathers, my behaviour, but it all constituted to something that was making the old bigger and bigger and bigger. When I sensed that something was different and something greater than me touched me in that special place, then, all, you know, don't get me wrong, I, I've been naughty as, as a believer. You know, I've done all sorts of things as a believer. I don't today. So today, I, I feel better. Mm. I, I feel clean. I, I, feel, I feel better. I feel my knowledge, my, my concentration. You might think it's stupid, but I didn't want to listen to no one because inside of me was this madness and, and, and so the ego and the pride and look how much money I've got and what car do I drive. And at the end of the day, you know, the peace that this promises the, the, the mindset, the change is real. The truth of the matter is, if we want to be set free from addictions, if we want to be set free from violence, if we want to be set free, trust me, you've got a chance here. And that's all it is. And it's about love and it's about peace. I know that this guy's changed, but I just think there's a chance for all of us in this. And I'm going to finish here. When I was younger, I used to really love my children, but I struggled to communicate on the level of love so I didn't feel worthy I didn't feel good I felt bad but God's given me and I shared it the other day about my grandchildren and I just think the whole of this thing is about we, our mind is for practical things it's to learn not to have conversations in not to think about things that are not good we need to come from the heart well God's used my grandchildren to break my heart yeah. and repair it so I try to do my thinking from here, not religion, not all that, just about the peace and the love of Christ. Uh, and he, and it's some, for somehow, he's healing this. And, and I'm using it nowadays for what it's meant for, to learn. Thank Absolutely. you. So, um, so the first one we've got through is, um, how can we see more people like Shane and Michael transform their lives? 
Um, yeah, Shane, if you could answer that, that'd be great. My answer to that is um, I can only direct people in the way I was directed and the way I was changed. Mm. Don't get me wrong, people can change in all sorts of ways, but for me, uh, God came into my life and it changed my life. And so I think the only way of people like myself and like anyone really can change is to, to, to try and, and, and search, just ask mm. God. Um, this Jesus, this Jesus Christ who Shane's talking about, if you're real, show me I'm sick in my sinful ways, I'm sick in my bad life, come into my life and, and do it behind your closed doors, do it wherever. And if something happens, go and find a local church and, and help. they'll help you. People do end up going to church. Sometimes we hear a message of your life's going to be perfect when you give your life to Jesus. Now, your life does change for the better. And it is the best thing I've ever done in my life, but it's not been the easiest. And I think sometimes the wrong message goes out because people come into church thinking everything's going to be all right. And when the first big hurdle comes along, they're gone because they were told, well, my life is going to be perfect. And it's not the case. It's tough, but it's the best thing you'll ever do. Know back in your own heart that Jesus is real. Years ago, I would have mocked someone for that, but... God definitely come into my life, change me uh, for the better. And, and I pray and hope that whoever's listening to this, it changes you as well. I really Amen. do. Absolutely. Um, so the next question we have is, um, what do you think whether we should be more severe or more humane in prisons to stop reoffending? I'm not sure what the answer to that is, because I think we're all individual. Um, you know, we all get emotional, we all get this, we're in prisons, we're in a, you know, every prison's different. You know, where Shane was, where I was. You know, I just think if we take away what the prison system means, if we break, take away what, what my values are or your values, I think at the end of the day, there's only one thing that can decide if we want to be set free in prison or in church or sitting here today is that we put the effort in. I think we can make it ourselves. It's, it's, our, it's our choices. Mm. But it's not only a Christianity. There's the, there's the programs of NA and AA and CA. There's alternative stuff going on. I just think we need to, you know, take an interest mm. in ourselves. And I think if we take an interest in ourselves and we learn to start loving ourselves and liking ourselves, I think we're that, we can be kind to the fellow man, whether it's a prison officer or, or whether it's a, a geezer in the cell next door. But I, I just think it's about us searching and, um, and it's not easy. Mm. It's not easy, but I, it's very hard to judge what prisons are like. I wouldn't like to be in them at the moment, but um, thank God I'm not. But I think it's about the individual and it's about having faith to believe that something greater than us can change how we are. Mm. I just want to wow. say thank you. Just mm. thanks for having me on and hope and pray that someone watches this, it does something or makes them think, plants a mm. seed, or just send someone on the right path, you know. Thanks for <laughs> turning up, son. I really mean so that. Shane. And if you I, want to find you. out more about Shane, his book can be found on Amazon and Waterstones. It's called Shane. And Sins of Fathers can also be found on um, Amazon, Waterstones and all the other outlets. Um, and so, yes, do follow us on social media and um, watch this space for future events.